Um, are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And what I'm trying to do is get this into like full screen mode. Um, somehow. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, so good morning. Um, uh, so today I want to focus on the transverse field Ising model, which I, uh, as I was saying, is our paradigmatic model for a quantum phase transition. So we started discussing it last time, and I'm going to continue with that. Uh, let me um, start with defining the model once more. So as you see here, it has two terms. One term we have previously discussed, and that's just an Ising interactions between neighboring spins, which favors ferromagnetic interactions. J is positive. And we saw how this model behaves as a function of temperature, um, where it uh, induces phase transitions from an ordered phase to a disordered paramagnet, right? Um, now we are going to, and moreover in one dimension, we showed there's no phase transition or rather the smallest temperature is able to disorder the ordered phase at zero temperature by the formation of domain walls. Now what we are going to do is add a second term to it, uh, a term which depends on Sx. And uh, the key point here are that these matrices, Sx and Sz, these are operators, which are the Pauli matrices, and they don't commute. So one term has a Zz interaction and the other one has a, a field which forces the spins to point along the x direction. And as a function of this tuning parameter H over J, we will see that there is a phase transition. Okay, so that's the problem at hand. So I'm going to do two things. Uh, the first one is to obtain an exact solution of the problem. Uh, this is useful because it just tells us what is the exact result. I can't result. hear you anymore. Yeah, I can't hear you either. Can't hear me? Oh, now I can. Not in my meeting, yeah. Ah. I stopped hearing you after you said we're going to do two things. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That is, it says internet unstable. Okay. Let's, uh, please point out if you don't hear me again. Um, okay. So the two things we'll do. First is a very particular jordan wigner transformation of the spin problem to a particle problem. Uh, you know, when I say particle, what I mean is a lattice of, let's say, fermions. And usually in fermions, we have uh, terms like the density of fermions and the hopping of fermions from site to site. So we'll transform the spin problem to such a problem. And then we can solve it exactly. That's the main virtue of that. But the greater insights into this problem will be obtained by doing perturbation theory at small field and large field. Okay. Now- I have a uh, question about the Jordan Wigner transform. Yes. Does that have anything to do with the spin statistics theorem? Are you, is that sort of underlying that transformation or is this, just something at the operator level that happens to work? Um, it is at just the operator level. Uh, so can you expand on your question a little more, Gabe? Um, so if you make the system relativistic, any spin one half field has to correspond to a uh, fermion field. So you can you'd automatically know that if I have something in terms of spin one half, I have some map from that part of like the Hilbert space to the fermion sector of the Hilbert space. So you know that you have yeah. this sort of duality between the two problems. Right, right. And it's exactly the same thing here because the Hilbert space of spin half operators is uh, 
is two uh, is two is, is of dimension two, and the Hilbert space of uh, uh, fermions, not, uh, spinless, is also two. Right, C and C dagger. Um, so it is sort of clear there will be a mapping between the two, but the problem it comes from the commutation relations not being the same. Is that something you have seen? Um, not outside of this. Uh -huh. I don't know how that is handled in the spin statistics. Um, so, you know, in general, when you have half integer spins, you can always write them as some fermionic operator. When you have integer spins, you can write it as some kind of bosonic operator. This is a very general theorem, well outside what I'm doing, very general. Uh -huh. Now, more specifically here, we encounter uh, the fact that the commutation relations are different for spins and fermions, but it can be fixed by what is the precise jordan wigner transformation comes in creating these string operators that um, fix the commutation relations. Okay. Yeah. So the two people who had not joined, I now see, hi Sandeep, I see you've joined. I don't see Franz yet. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, so now um, I am wondering whether I started on this Jordan Wigner last time, and I'm wondering if I should repeat some aspects or should we just turn to the end result and maybe come back to it when we need it? Okay, let me do that. Um, so let me, because this is a little bit formal. It's useful to know there is such an exact result, but the meaning of that is what I will come back to. So right now, I'm going to move a little bit from the exact solution to trying to get some insight into the two phases, okay? Let's go to that because it'll be more interesting to discuss. So I'm rewriting that um, transverse field Ising model you know, the difference between the S operator and the sigma is a factor of half. And I don't want to be carrying that around. So I have now just written it in terms of the Pauli matrices. Okay, so now let's try to get a visual picture of what the two phases are. So you can right away see, let's look at the phase at J equal to zero. Okay, so when J is zero, the magnetic field wants to align all the spins in the X direction. Because of the minus factor here, if the spin is aligned in the X direction, its energy is lowered. So you can see that at H equal to zero, all the spins on the N sites will be lined up in the X direction. Now, you can use a particular basis so if you are using the Z basis, this spin which is lying in the X direction can be written as a, a linear combination of up and down, as you know. Okay, now if H is not, uh, if J is not precisely zero, but J is small, then what does J do? It basically, in the basis of the X operator, in the X basis, the Z spin essentially causes spin flips, meaning a, a spin on a site will flip from pointing to the right to pointing to the left. Right, do you see that? So uh, the key point here is that the H term is a single site term. So it's not going to describe a phase at all. That's the first thing you can see right away. To get a phase which has some kind of order, you need the spins to interact. Here, these are completely uncorrelated spins. When J is zero, 
the correlation length is zero. Basically, every site is an independent site. As J is increased, you start to increase some correlation between neighboring sites. And that correlation length then grows as you come toward G critical, okay? So essentially the phase greater than G critical is a disordered phase in which the correlation length grows as you come toward G critical. So that's the description of the high uh, coupling, large coupling phase. Let's now come to G equal to zero or H equal to zero. That phase is our Ising model. So at zero G, which means zero magnetic field, all the spins are either all up or all down. So this phase you can see has Z2 symmetry. And just like we discussed previously, uh, there is spontaneously broken symmetry, um, which will happen um, on it, you know, naturally as you are coming to that uh, zero temperature, um, as you are going toward, let's say, uh, below G critical, the system will spontaneously break the Z2 symmetry and pick one or the other ground state. So let's say it has picked the up ground state where the spins are up on every site. Now, what does H do? H is an X operator. And in the Z basis, the X operator causes spin flips. So once again, when G is small, it's going to mix configurations in the ground state, which are not just all up, but all up with some down spins and so on. And by mixing such configurations in the ground state, the long range magnetic order, so this is our order parameter. You remember when we were doing classical phase transitions, we looked at the uh, expectation value of SZ in the thermal ensemble. Now we are looking at expectation values of the operator in concern sigma Z in the wave function, psi g. So the ground state wave function is getting modified as you increase g. And in this modified wave function, we will evaluate the expectation value of sigma z. And clearly, because there are some spin flip configurations now included in the ground state, that order parameter will be reduced. So the result is, that you get a picture like this. For small G, yeah, go ahead. I have a quick question. So, um, so usually for Ising model, we define the Z2 symmetry as the product of um, sigma X, right? So I, I wonder if we can define the Z2 symmetry as a product of sigma Z. So meaning that at high temperature RAM, their independence being actually the state breaks the Z2 symmetry. But when you go to the G uh, close to zero, that doesn't break any sim the Z2 symmetry at all. Uh, you mean in uh, which, which phase are you talking about, Yanjun? Uh, yeah, so can you go back to the Hamiltonian? Yeah, right. So here. usually the Z2 symmetry is defined as the product of sigma x, right? Uh, no, Z2 is defined by the symmetry that you get by taking sigma Z to minus sigma Z. That's right. That's defined by, by the, like, the product of sigma X matrix. Uh, okay. Sigma, uh, uh, yes, X matrix. Because when you apply the product of sigma yeah. X, the sigma Z with flip sign. Yes, yes. That's yeah. right. Uh, so I wonder if we can define the uh, the Z2 as uh, a product of sigma Z. So that at high temperature, uh, like at large G, the H will flip sign, but the, the, the first thing does not flip sign at all. Ah, uh, yes, yes, you can do that. You can definitely do that. So yeah, now I see what you're saying. Uh, that if you define it as sigma Z, so you know, uh, but then, uh, so at, if you define it as sigma z, um, then sigma z acting on a sigma x, x will, flip. Yeah. will flip it to That's the right. negative side. Yes. That's right. But uh, there is no broken symmetry in the high g. 
yeah, I wondering if I define the Z2 symmetry that way, meaning that at high G, I will break the Z2 symmetry, but at small G, I won't break the Z2 symmetry because that's the uh, sigma Z symmetry. Yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, in the Hamiltonian, absolutely right. In the Hamiltonian, uh, the first term, sigma Z term, won't be affected. So it has the Z2 symmetry. And mm -hmm. you will only spontaneously break that Z2 symmetry in the low G uh, phase. Okay. Is that clear? So the spontaneous breaking happens not at the Hamiltonian level. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. It will happen um, in the system picking one of the states uh, that are uh, part of that uh, part of that degenerate sector. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so the end result of this uh, these arguments is that if and I'm going to show you how to do that perturbation theory next. That's the large part of today's uh, lecture. But let's just sketch out. Um, so the Low G side is the ordered magnet with an order parameter M defined by the expectation value of sigma Z. And that order parameter decreases uh, all the way finally vanishing at G critical. Okay, so this is how you would see um, a quantum phase transition that the order parameter will vanish at some G critical. On the disordered side, there is no order parameter, but you can look at the correlation length, the sigma Z, sigma Z correlation length on the large G side will decay exponentially. Uh, but that exponential length will diverge at the critical point. So if you define one over C, as some scale, then you can see that will go to zero at G critical. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture of the quantum phase transition at zero temperature. Uh, can I ask? Yes, Jay, go ahead. So uh, classically, when uh, we switch on a magnetic field and then increase its intensity, it just uh, goes on a crossover to the uh, other phase or uh, so th there are no exponents right classically so for classically, this this kind of a transition right exactly classically that magnetic field if you remember is in the same direction as the magnetization so here the magnetization is along the Z direction, right? The field that you put is a symmetry breaking field in the same direction as Z. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we are doing something that's why quite different where the field is a, symmet is a, a transverse field. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, you wouldn't see such a behavior in um, uh, classically. Okay. Uh, classically, fields always smooth out directions, uh, smooth out transitions. So that's a good point. So, so here it's because of the non-commutivity exactly. of sigma z and sigma x. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So. Uh so I, I had a question. Yes, Nishcha. So, yeah. So can you go to the phase diagram where you had small g and large g? Yeah, so I yes. can, uh, yeah. So uh, I understand that the ground states on the two sides are very different in the sense that, uh, yeah, one is spontaneously broken symmetry. The other one is you're breaking, explicitly breaking the symmetry. But what is the argument that uh, you're going to have a phase transition and not like a smooth crossover or something. Yeah, so right now I've just argued, I'm now, so the way we, so we know here, uh, luckily this is one of the few problems we can solve exactly. And okay. from the exact solution we see, uh, th this is now the, 
uh, Jordan Wigner one, where we see uh, excitation gap. It's not the order parameter, but you see the excitation gap closing at G critical. Let me let me oh. just flash that. Uh, okay, I'll come back to that later. But uh, two gaps okay. on both sides close, giving this phase transition. Here, okay. one can just argue that the form of the wave function on the two sides, uh, you can get it in some power series in G, and they are there's no analytic way to transform it from one to the other. This is just an argument right now, but I'll show you more okay. as we do the um, uh, do the perturbation theory. Okay. So essentially, just like uh, the finite temperature case where we needed something non-analytical in the free energy. You cannot just do a low temperature expansion or a high temperature expansion and see the singularities. And they appeared only in the infinite system. Similarly here, what will the corresponding statement is, we can do perturbation theory in small g and large g, but you have to ultimately do the calculation to all orders in G to see the non-analytic structure at G critical. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So earlier you had said that when we take G going to infinity, that doesn't really correspond to a phase? Oh yeah, by phase I mean uh, th there's no order parameter. So anything above G critical, um, I was saying that that is not uh, that state of matter. I'm calling it a quantum paramagnet. Uh, you can call it a phase if you want. It is a quantum paramagnet, but it does not have a have an order parameter to characterize it. Okay. It's a disordered phase. Okay. So the best way to describe a quantum phase transition is a transition from an ordered to a disordered phase. And the disordered phase doesn't have an order parameter. You cut out a little bit there for me. I cut out again. Hello? At least for me, it may be my internet though. Yeah, I, I heard you the whole time. Okay, okay. Oh, then it was just my internet. Okay, good. It, yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um. Hi, Franz. I see you've joined in. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't find the link. Oh, it's always on Zoom. Go to Zoom, uh, Carmen Canvas Zoom. It's the same link every time. Yeah, the thing is, like, sometimes when I look through the assignments, there are many different links, and I'm, it's hard to find the correct one. So I guess uh, I'll have you to... You should like, just go to Carmen it. Canvas. Yeah, I was, I was on Carmen Canvas. Okay, well, talk to, talk to me afterwards. We'll sort it out. Sure. Okay, let's come now to perturbation theory. So this is going to be fun. This is like perturbation theory you may have done in quantum mechanics. So I'm going to do four different, I'm going to sketch it quickly because, you know, it should be sort of familiar, but I'm going um, to do... Sorry, I have, I have a quick question. Yes, Yanjo. So uh, for classical icing model, we have like uh, two ground states, right? And low temperature. So here at very small g, uh, we expect that we also have two ground state. So that would mean that we have a degenerate, degenerate ground state. So yes. then you only have like positive m, what about negative m? Right, right. So what I'm always assuming that I have spontaneously broken the degeneracy and picked one of them. Yes, but um, but you have two degenerate ground state. I mean, yeah. uh, the ground state can be a superposition of these two as well. That is that is right. I'm kind of let ignore. Uh, I'm so what I'm trying to say is I'm up. What I'm doing is let's say I apply another term, which is H Z sigma Z. Okay. A very very tiny H Z. Okay. And then. I uh, break the symmetry between up and down and pick the up. I see. What you are saying is also important. 
uh, if my sis, uh, you, if my system is not very large, I can mm -hmm. make a cat state. Mm -hmm. So what is a cat state? A cat state is a macroscopic superposition of the big up and the big down spins. Mm -hmm. And now you can, so literally what you're saying is there is a barrier between the up, the two states are degenerate, up and down, mm -hmm. and there's a barrier mm -hmm. between them. And the mm -hmm. system, it's a quantum mechanical system, it can tunnel between the two and make this cat state. That's right. Um, so, and that has its own very interesting physics and dynamics. I'm, a, I'm ignoring that a, li a little bit here by mm -hmm. saying that um, I put a small magnetic field HZ that couples to the same direction as the order parameter, sigma Z, and mm -hmm. I break that degeneracy and pick one of them. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, these are good questions. So definitely ask me these questions because I think it benefits everybody. Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to show you uh, what is the ground state for G small, ground state for G large, and what is the excited state for G small and G large? Okay, so these are the four things I want to get across. And let's see, the idea is, uh, the main idea is to write down your Hamiltonian in a block form. And what I mean by that is um, I have N sites, each site can be, this is like very general and you'll see it in many different contexts of organizing your perturbation theory in this way. You have N sites, each site can be up or down. So you have two to the N configurations and you want to organize your Hamiltonian like this. So in the basis state of all of these two to the N configurations, you can write down in this small block here, all uh, the elements of the Hamiltonian for all up configuration. There's only one um, because I'm ignoring the all down, otherwise that would have been degenerate as I just said. The second block has one spin flip term. So that is a manifold of this kind. You have one spin flip, and then all the others are up and there are N such configurations. So this is an N fold degenerate configuration here. And then there's a two spin flip and so on. Now H1, which is the perturbation. So I'm doing small g, which means my sigma x is the perturbation. Sigma x basically is like a spin flip. Uh, so it takes me from all up to one spin flip. Another application of H1 will take me to two spin flip. And then I can act H1 again in reverse. And you see sigma X is a combination of sigma plus plus sigma minus. So that now you can go in reverse and come from two spin flip to one spin flip back to all up. So that's the basic idea. And you can now do second order perturbation theory which I think, which all of you can do. And you can figure out the ground state energy. Um, what is the correction to that? The first order correction in G is going to be zero because once you spin, flip a spin, there's no way to come back to the ground state. You have to flip, flip twice. So the first correction comes to order G square. And I will, I've set it up here in the notes. I will let you read that. But basically what you find is there is a correction to the ground state, which goes like um, G square. Oh, sorry, uh, G square. Some, my, some of my uh, units may be wrong here. Let's see, NJ, no, this is good, this is good. So you can see this term G is H divided by J, right? So the correction goes like H square over J. That's the typical structure of a second order correction. Uh, H square, which is the perturbation divided by the denominator, which has a factor of J. And so that's the correction. And your energy, and it's always negative. Second order corrections are always negative. 
So that's the structure. That's how your energy uh, changes in the ground state. Okay, now more interesting for us is the magnetization. And what you find is that the magnetization goes like one at G equal to zero. And there's a decrease in magnetization by G square over eight. Um, to get that factor of eight, you have to figure out how your wave function gets renormalized. And I'm going to let you read the notes uh, essentially, your wave function will have some component of all up, and then you will get uh, mixing from one down, two down, etc. And uh, I have some more detailed algebra to show you how these corrections come about. And ultimately, that is the result for your uh, wave function. So your wave function will get corrected to order g square. And from that, you will be able to see that sigma z gets this uh, decrease by g squared over 8. Okay, so please go through that. I think these are fun calculations. And, uh, you know, you'll see how it's operating in this uh, context of the transverse fieldizing model. Okay, this is pretty standard. So let me chug on to the other limit where now j is much, much less than h. So I can define g tilde as my dimensionless uh, um, variable to control the perturbation theory. And again, we will organize our uh, Hamiltonian now in this basis. So I have no flip. And you know, at some level, you can always uh, redefine your x and z but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep them lying on the x-axis just to kind of uh, not, you know, keep switching my basis. So, but you can do it in any basis you want. I'm doing it in the x basis. So everything is along the x direction. Then I can have one flip, two flip, et cetera. And you can now um, write down the perturbation, which is sigma z, sigma z on neighboring sites. And that becomes this kind of a term. You will get uh, two flips on neighboring sites or a flip up and a flip down on neighboring sites and so on. And again, you can organize your uh, perturbation theory. You start with the ground state. You uh, flip two spins to the left. You get an energy denominator. You flip two spins back to the right and you return to the ground state. So you can work that out and you find again that your energy will be modified by J square over H now. And uh, yeah, so that's the result of the ground state. Okay, I didn't do it here, but you could also do the sigma Z sigma Z correlator and show that as you um, do these uh, terms in H, you're increasing the distance over which the sigma Zs are getting correlated. And that is how you can extract a correlation length. Okay, let me wait here, and then we go to the excited states. Any questions? Okay, I think this is kind of standard. Okay, now let's do the excited states. Uh, actually, let me do the large G first. Large G is much easier than small G here. So in the large G phase, um, what I want to do is work. Now I'm looking at the excited state, right? So, so far what we did was we figured out how is the ground state getting renormalized by all of these multiple hoppings. Uh, multiple sort of um, flippings to the left. Now I want to go to the excited state, which is in this middle block, and that is n-fold degenerate. So since it is degenerate, the lowest order correction should affect these states, right? This, this is now degenerate perturbation theory. So the smallest, uh, so at order g tilde or order j over h, 
I should see uh, the, the energy getting modified. Okay, so what you find is that here is, let's say, um, one of the states in the excited state manifold, right? It's one of the states now in this manifold with one spin flip. So here it is, that green arrow to the left, that's an initial state. Sigma Z, Sigma Z acting on it, essentially uh, flips a state on the I plus one at site to the left. And it'll give you another term, which is, it, there'll be more than this term, but let me just say there'll be another term from the Sigma I, which will flip it. No, this is the only term, sorry. It'll flip it to the right. So what has happened is, it looks as if this green object has moved from I to I plus one. So that is where this process is essentially like a particle hopping to the right from the I to the I plus one at site. Okay. And this can be seen, of course, totally explicitly in the Jordan Wigner transformation. But even here, you can see that. And so the effectively what you're getting is a Hamiltonian which hops a particle from I to I plus one, and you can now go into momentum space and get the, those N fold degenerate states that you had will essentially open up into a band, a cosine band um, of this form. So the degeneracy is lifted and you get a band of states given by epsilon k with a minimum at k equal to zero. So that's the result of um, the perturbation theory in j over h at large g. Okay, good. So um, we are getting a grip on the ground state and excited states. Let's do the last remaining one which is the excitation now in the ordered phase. So in the ordered phase, uh, I had all spins up, let's say at uh, H equal to zero. Now the first excited state is a state with a spin down, a spin flip. Now what you can see is that essentially these two regions, the spin down interacting with the up, that's like a domain wall on the left. And you similarly have another domain wall on the right. So this is like one spin flip, which creates two domain walls. And what is interesting, you can see that from here, that if this down spin were to hop if there were any number of downspins in between, let's say, these two domain walls, the energy would be the same. Because wh whether you have an up-up or a down-down, the energy is minus J for both cases. So the only cost in energy is when there is a down and an up. So you can put any number of these flipped spins in between, and not cost more energy. So the domain wall can easily move apart at no additional cost in energy. So there's a big difference in the kind of excitation on the two sides. Um, on the disordered side, the paramagnet side, we found that the excitation was, you could create a single spin flip excitation. Here, you naturally create two domain walls. There's no way to create just one domain wall. You will naturally create two domain walls. So keep that in mind. And we will now analyze the uh, experiments and see how that plays out. Any questions? So um, are we assuming periodic boundary conditions here? Is that why we can't make two domain, uh, one domain wall? Uh, so I am assuming that, um, uh, so if you had, yeah, I am assuming periodic boundary conditions, you know, so what Jay is asking is suppose I had, 
I did not have periodic boundary conditions. I could just have the left side be all up, the right side be all down, and then I would get one domain wall between this up and down. Okay, but since I want to put periodic boundary conditions at the end of the chain, I want to come back to the original, then I must have two domain walls. Any other questions? Any other questions? This is also uh, true uh, for. Uh, um, is this also true for the classical case? Yeah. Okay. The classical case as well. Yeah. So, uh, is there any uh, relation between um, these excitations and the Jordan Wigner transformation? Like, I was thinking that when you're doing Jordan Wigner transformation, you are describing the system uh, through fermions. And can I, like, mathematically, it's a transformation and it works, but physically, can I see the transformation? Can I see that fermion as an excitation? Uh, similar to these domain walls. Right. Uh, yeah, that, um, so let, so in the Jordan Wigner, um, what it ends up describing, so Jordan Wigner will also give you some excitations and what it describes is, is a kink. I wasn't going to go into that, but basically, um, if you look at a single domain wall or a kink, uh, you know, the Jordan Wigner had that string object. And yeah. that is very much Definitely. like describing this kink object. So the, you, it's a bit harder to see that uh, in the trans, in the mathematics, but it is there that these uh, the, the string object is identical to uh, this domain wall, which can be thought of as two kinks. So you have sort of a kink, meaning there's a change in magnetization from up to down. So let's say that's a positive, uh, that's a negative kink. And then uh, from down to up, that's a positive kink. So you can think of it as, this is a topological defect. You can call it a plus charge and a minus charge, like our vortices, vortices and anti-vortices, and they were bound. And uh, then below the transition, they were bound. Above the transition, they got unbound. So similarly here, you can think of this kink as a positive charge and a negative charge, and they can be bound. And if they are bound, they don't destroy the order. If they get, if you have a proliferation of many, many kinks and anti-kinks, then you can destroy order. So it becomes a topological way of understanding the breakdown of order. Also, it seems like when you go to a small g and large g, uh, because for this limit, uh, the the domain wall can go over like the size of the, the 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 energy cost of a domain wall does not depend on its size so it seems that if i have um, like it's easy to destroy order in this phase as compared to the other phase um uh, no this is not so that, uh, spontaneously destroyed it's not like thermal okay i will come to some of these later that in 1d we found in the classical problem, thermal fluctuations created these domain walls and destroyed order, right? Yeah. Here, you can ask why, now here, again, we are creating domain walls coming to Brad's question, but they are being created by quantum fluctuations. You see the difference? Uh, we, we are not, uh, it's again, the same configurations, but here at zero temperature, it's the H plus, uh, H uh, perp term that is creating these spin flips. So those are what we call quantum fluctuations. Um, but they are not able to destroy order right away. You have to go to some critical H to destroy it. 
Why is that? So let's wait to answer that question a little bit. I will have to show you some more things about mapping uh, quantum problems to classical problems. Is everybody good with a quantum fluctuation versus a classical fluctuation? So for a quantum fluctuation, we have to explicitly include it in the Hamiltonian. That's right. For a quantum fluctuation, the two non-commuting terms have to be explicitly included in the Hamiltonian. And a good way to think about it is, you know, this tower of states. Uh, you get, you know, the tower of states is just a way of counting configurations, right? Uh, so you have two to the n configurations, even in the classical problem, but they are weighted by e to the minus beta h. That's what weights the uh, the the a probability of a particular configuration contributing at a certain temperature. Here, temperature is zero, so everything is about the wave function. But again, it's a question of which configurations are getting included in the wave function. Good? Let's see. Let me... How's everybody doing? Is it good? Are you, uh, are you, um, are you getting the idea? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Actually, can I ask one more thing? Yes. So I guess I'm not sure I understand the physical meaning of a quantum fluctuation if it's something that like we can tune. Like what does it mean exactly for us to be able to increase or decrease quantum fluctuations? Uh, could somebody try to answer that? Who would like to answer? Let me just pick on someone. Um, uh, la, la, la. Let's see, who would like to answer? I'd, I'd much rather somebody raise their hand. <laughs> Pokwan, you want to answer? Mm. Mm. No. <laughs> what do you when when I say quantum fluctuation, what does it mean to you? So I think this uh, so for the thermal fluctuation. This frustration is introduced by temperature, and but for the quantum frustration, it's like you have different uh, interaction. They are not in the same basis, and just by this different kind of uh, perturbation, and you will there will be some some phase transition. I think it's the my yeah. understanding. Yeah, let's try to just focus on the word quantum fluctuation. What are we calling? What exactly uh, do we mean by that fluctuation? Changyan, you want to give it a stab? Okay, are you saying something, Changyan? I can't hear you. Maybe your mic is muted. Anybody else? I can try to answer. Okay. So by quantum fluctuation, uh, we're describing a process by which these spin flip operators in the Hamiltonian 
can flip the system from its classical, a, a given classical configuration. So for example, if we would expect it in the classical system uh, for the most favorable ground state configuration to be all up without any fluctuations at zero temperature, then in this case, since we have these spin flip operators in the Hamiltonian itself, then now we can introduce uh, spin flips about this classical ground state. Exactly. So good. I think uh, different people are saying the same thing. And the main idea is that at you have a ma you have magnetic interactions, you expect the system to order at zero temperature. Order means all the spins should be up because thermally there are no fluctuations. But quantum mechanically, there is an H sigma X term which will try to flip the spins from up to down. And as you go to greater and greater h, your wave function is including more and more of these spin flip processes in the ground state. So the order is getting lower and lower and that's why your, uh, your magnetization is becoming smaller. Now on the other side, can we only talk about quantum fluctuations in the ordered side? What about the disordered side? Anybody wants to say whether on the disordered side there is a meaning to quantum fluctuations? So you, you just drew it, right? Uh, the spin flips. So those are quantum fluctuations arising from the perturbation. Exactly. Which is, which is basically like a, a free field theory and then you're introducing uh, interactions. Exactly. So you have to pick your basis. So again, you know, in the large H direction, your basis would be sigma X relative to that. Because again, if it's disordered, uh, then um, all, and there's a field, right? So your natural expectation is everything to the right, to the left, right, and now there are flips with respect to that. Okay, good, everybody got that. Now let's look briefly at the data. I have one more doubt. Yes. Can I? So in, in the classical, like classical icing model, we have this free energy, which is like energy minus, like in, like in the entropy contribution term, like TS. So is there some similar an analog here? I mean, where, which, you know, like in the, for example, in the low temperature energy dominate and high temperature temperature dominate. Is there an analogy in the quantum case? Yeah, that's a very good question. Here, um, here, it's only about the energy because the entropy is... is temperature is, is zero. I mean, yeah. temperature is zero. So basically, if you were to... The entropic part doesn't play a role. It's only about the energy. But it's just um yeah so there isn't uh lit the way would be that in one on one side you know the energy has two components it's either the exchange energy or the field energy you can break up your energy into two parts just like you had energy and entropy in the thermal transition here you would say that you know in your hamiltonian you have two terms, the exchange term, the J term, and the field term. And you can look at the expectation values of each of them separately. And there would be like an energy dominated, sorry, exchange dominated to field dominated. But that's the... But, but is, there, is there a way to quantify this quantum fluctuation? I mean, like we say that the fee, like a phase transition like uh, controlled by a quantum fluctuation. So. How do you quantify the, like that fluctuation? Right, right. So that will take us to, uh, to writing down this Hamiltonian now in terms of a field theory. Okay. So uh, is when we write it as a field theory, you will see it will be like a Lagrangian we wrote before. We will have an action and then you can see the different terms in that action. So I will come back, come to that. So is, is there a, uh, some correlator which we can measure uh, uh, continuing off of Sandeep's question? So is there a quantum version of the fluctuation dissipation theorem? 
susceptibility and correlator? Yeah, I mean, so he was asking for the measure of like quantum fluctuations. So yeah. I think the we we resolve that in so the, the classical case by getting the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Right. So here you can measure. So you can still measure things like. Uh, uh, so for example, you know there is a correlation length which will diverge from both sides, and corresponding with that correlation length, there will be a susceptibility. The susceptibility will be to the field, okay? So the, the tuning parameter, G. So just like in the thermal transition, we were able to look at uh, what is the change in magnetization due to temperature. And that gave a huge response at the critical temperature. Now we can look at what is the what is the response of the magnetization to the field that you're applying? And in fact, you can look at both fields, the one we are applying and also another field, the Z field. And these response functions can now give us susceptibilities even at zero temperature and tell you about the quantum fluctuations. Yeah. Now, uh, another thing that Sandeep was saying is how would you see the quantum fluctuation? I'm going to map this problem to a field theory in which you will see the spins evolve. Uh, you know, just like in a classical problem, the configurations fluctuated due to the temperature. Here they will evolve in time. And that evolution in time will be an indicator of a quantum fluctuation. Let's come to that. Uh, was yeah, there any last? Let me one more question. More question. Yes. Uh, so can, can we see that the quantum fluctuation can be seen by the entanglement in inner states? I say this is because I, I think the fluctuation shouldn't be defined according to your basis. It should be independent of basis. So you can define the fluctuation this way. You can define your local fluctuation as SI minus the average of SI. And if you're going to look at the magnitude of fluctuation, which basically give you the correlation function. Yeah. So and if you're I going to have a non-zero correlation, which means you have a non-zero flu quantum fluctuation, and you will definitely have some entanglement in your state. Is that right? I want to be till we define entanglement. I want to wait on that a bit. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to wait on that because um, connecting entanglement with the critical point is something that needs more uh, discussion. So I would say that's a that's an important question. Clearly, the two phases are unentangled. Mm -hmm. They are just product states, right? Okay. Yeah. And near the transition, something is happening. But let's wait to bring in entanglement mm -hmm. as an important idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I have a, another question. So how does this uh, definition of quantum fluctuation relate to uh, the definition that a lot of us had learned before about how for example, in a vacuum, you can create like pairs of particles due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, energy and time. It's exactly the same thing. And in fact, some, uh, the most beautiful example of quantum fluctuations is the cosmic microwave background picture. You know, we've all seen that picture, right? Pink and blue. And those are showing uh, sort of temperature fluctuations today around the 2.7 degree Kelvin uh, average temperature. Where did that come from? It came from the very early universe uh, quantum fluctuations, which led you know, ultimately to these small fluctuations and, see, and that they have formed the seeds of uh, uh, galaxies and so on. But that fluctuation is in the early universe 
uh, quantum fluctuations. Also, what you said, uh, um, you know, particle creation, the Casimir effect, all of these are quantum fluctuations. Okay, um, the experiment I'm about to show is, uh, let's see, I, it brings out the following, and this is from the notes, all these notes are on Carmen Canvas, uh, but specifically, this is the part I didn't finish from last lecture, and I'm going to just quickly come to that. And it's rare to find a situation where there is a model and then there is some uh, non-trivial experiment. So, so do go through my notes. I've kind of worked hard to put a lot of things in there. Um, and to connect it with the experiment. So this is what an experiment is trying to do. It's a neutron scattering experiment, okay? So um, one of the ways we study magnetic systems is neutron scattering because a neutron uh, carries um, energy and momentum. It scatters off your system, comes out with some uh, new energy and momentum the difference is transferred to the system, okay? And, um, and uh, so when it is transferred to the system, uh, it will basically give us a picture of the kinds of excitations the system has. Because if a system doesn't have an, the ability to excite with that mode, it cannot absorb or emit, right? So that is how looking at inelastic neutron scattering gives us a picture of the excitations within the system. Okay, now let's see what happens. When you have um, the disordered phase, uh, a neutron can flip a single spin uh, and it can give you a sort of a sharp excitation and that is shown here in the data. So this is data on a particular material called cobalt niobate, and we don't need all the details here. All we need to know is that it has a spin, uh, which is um, effectively a spin half. So it actually has a spin of three halves and it has some angular momentum and you combine it all with, uh, uh, with um, uh, the total angular momentum. And you may say, well, how do you get quite half? But um, there is there is some um, some effective spin story here, which I can tell you later. But in any case, think of a spin half, which is forming this sort of a zigzag chain, and this um, prop, this material has been investigated by the Coldia group uh, very recently, like 2010, and they can do two things: they can do elastic scattering. Right? We have talked about elastic scattering, which gives us the structure of the magnetic moments. And from that, they can look at the order parameter. So the intensity of elastic scattering tells us what is the order parameter, magnetization. And that shows the steady decrease. And finally, it goes to zero at some critical field. So one of the things to notice here is uh, this Mm, this critical field is around five Tesla. So uh, the energy scale of J is also on the order of, it's on the order of like few millivolt. One millivolt is about one Tesla. If you do G mu B H and convert a, a magnetic field into a energy scale, one millivolt is about one Tesla. This is a good number to keep in mind. Uh, so basically around five Tesla, uh, the field is able to overcome the magnet, the exchange uh, energy and drive it into a paramagnet. Okay, great. Now let's look at inelastic scattering. Okay, so here is five Tesla critical field. There is a scan below that and a scan above that. And let's just eyeball what we are seeing. So 
somebody should try to describe to me, what are you seeing at four Tesla and what is the difference at 5.5 Tesla? No, uh, sorry, at six Tesla. So everything except the six Tesla is, yeah, let's look at two extremes, six Tesla and four Tesla. What are you noticing? Anybody? Kyle, you want to chime in? Sure. Um, so, you, what's this? What's this color bar? Sorry. Right. So that's the first thing. When you see something like this, people these days show a lot of data in color bars, and so you'll see beautiful colors. And so color bar is shown here. So this. They are plotting blue means low, red means high. And what is this the intensity of? It's the intensity of, um, um, it's telling you about the intensity of uh, your scattered, intensity of your scattered beam. That's what you're measuring, okay? So what is being measured is inelastic neutron scattering. You're measuring, you have something coming in. When you uh, are detecting, you are detecting the intensity of the neutron at different angles. So you're doing an energy momentum scan. Okay. So, I mean, so the, so the difference is that, I guess in the four Tesla case, you're getting these, getting higher intensities at higher, energies right and then yes opposite in six tesla exactly so what you're seeing this exactly this behavior here you see very sharp intensity at low energies here you see sort of a blob a continuum of uh, of and much lower intensity but a continuum of of excitations over a range of energies and then something sharp at much higher energies. Okay, and the understanding of this is exactly sitting in the discussion we have had today. So again, we have kind of run out of time a little bit, but the main point is, and we'll probably won't have time to pick it up uh, next time, we'll have to move on, but do read this in detail. The in simple words, what is happening is at high field, you can make a single spin flip excitation. And that is a good excitation. It can hop around. So what you are seeing is basically the dispersion relation for that spin flip moving around the lattice. And that epsilon of K that we calculated is precisely this epsilon of K. So that is beautiful. We actually calculated the spectrum of that spin flip mode. What happened on the low G side? You couldn't create one domain wall. You had to create two kinks. So the problem with creating two kinks is let's say the neutron scatters off the material and gives one millivolt of energy to the system and uh, some momentum, okay? now. Here it says there's a very sharp relation between the momentum you give and the energy you excite. There's a one, a particular momentum has one energy associated with it. At low G, a given energy can be uh, distributed between the two kinks. A given momentum can be distributed between the two kinks. So you can uh, partition one millivolt 0.5.5 or 0.8.2. There are many ways of doing it. And that's why for a given momentum, you get a whole range of energies. Or for a given energy, you can also create two kinks with different momenta. And so that's why you get a whole range of momenta. So this is a clear case of not having a sharp excitation, but a sort of a fractionalized excitation. So this is the beginning of something like fractionalization that you are seeing here. Your domain wall is fractionalized into two kinks. 
And the result of having two kinks is a continuum of excitations. Okay, so let's end here. This is the beginning of lots of things you'll see in research. My own research is on quantum spin liquids. And in quantum spin liquids, you have fractionalized uh, magnons. So these spin waves are called magnons and they, they are obviously bosonic excitations, but in spin liquids, they can fractionalize just like the domain walls have fractionalized. Spin liquids have fractionalized magnons and these fractionalized magnons also give you uh, what I call Rothko pictures. This is like a broad featureless continuum uh, with no structure in there. On the other hand, if you have magnons, they would show up or any other sharp quasi particle. Here we don't have magnons. We have spin flip particles that move around, but this is a sharp excitation. Okay, great. I'll have to stop here. I do recommend that you read on a bit and uh, look at some of the other things in this paper where uh, they now make it even more fancy. They apply a magnetic field in the Z direction and create a confining potential. And in that confining potential, uh, literally it, they have to solve a quantum mechanical problem of bound states in a confining potential. And that is literally um, the same kind of problem as QCD in which the kinks are the quarks and uh, the bound states are mesons. And you get uh, you know, these bound states within that uh, and the whole field theory of uh, E8 symmetry, all of those bound states have been observed in the data. Look at this. This is the same continuum now in a magnetic field here. This is the same continuum, uh, but now they apply a confining, to create a confining potential, they add another magnetic field in the Z direction. And that creates these bound states uh, within the confining potential and they have been able to observe that. So we don't need to go into that for our course, but you know, this is like one of the cutting edge experiments uh, where, um, a real material with spin orbit coupling allows us to get such a spin state. And uh, then using very good uh, data, you can uh, disentangle not just the transverse field Ising model physics, which would have been a good, uh, you know, yes, 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 this all worked out, but taking it much more beyond that to see some other aspects of field theory. Okay, great, I'll stop here. Uh, if you have questions, uh, last minute ones, please ask now. We have time. And uh, then also add to the discussion forum. And have a great weekend. Okay, go ahead. Yep. So would you say that this system is a spin liquid? Or like no. It a no. No, because okay. it has long range order. So in the low G phase, the system okay. had um, long range order. So, you know, we have seen sort of different systems. We saw the XY model, which had no long range order, but it had topological defects. Here is a problem which has long range order, and yet the defects in that, or the excitations you can call it, are, uh, these kinks and anti-kinks, topological in nature. In a true spin liquid, um, you don't have long range order uh, and you have entanglement in the phase itself that Feng Shi was talking about. Um, and topological uh, excitations, fractionalized. So yeah. This would still fall within the Landau paradigm because it has long range order. Okay, more questions? 
Um, I'm curious about in the Hamiltonian for the sigma x, you were saying how it like flips the one of the spins, but to minimize the energy, wouldn't it have to be in the x direction? So wouldn't that be a superposition of both up and down? So why does it just flip it instead of putting it into a superposition of both? Are you talking about the low G or the high G? Um, I mean, low G, but low it... G. Yeah, okay. Um, so, just to minimize the energy, it was, that part should be, as you increase G, it would, should point more in the X direction. And so it should be a superposition both up doing. and down. Yeah, which is what it is doing. So uh, when, so let's, so are you okay with picking one of the phases up relative to down as your starting point? Because that yeah. is a different physics of broken symmetry. Yeah. Okay. So now you're starting with everything up. Mm -hmm. When you apply the X operator, right? What is the X operator? The sigma X, you have to write now in the sigma Z basis, and you can write it as sigma plus plus sigma minus. Sigma X operator is a sum of the raising operator and the lowering operator. But if everything is up, the raising operator doesn't play a role. It can't raise it more because this is a spin half problem. So only the lowering operator acts. Okay. okay. That's why it flips it down. Later, when you act at any finite G, there will be configurations with both up and down spins. And now sigma x will flip a down spin up and an up spin down. But at a given site, only one of the two terms will act, right? But as long as it just flips it and so as long as the spin is definitely up or down, wouldn't that contribute the same amount of energy since? No. Because it, the, in, in that phase, the interactions depend on the nearest neighbor. Right? Because the energy depends on sigma z i sigma z i plus one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, more questions? So we're meeting this Friday. Is it at one? Uh, right. At one or two? We are meeting this Friday uh, at one thirty, or maybe one. I forgot what it says on our Carmen. Can, does anybody remember? I believe I it's it one, one to two thirty. One to two thirty. So let's all meet at one, and we'll start having your wonderful presentations. I hope everyone has run their presentations by now. Some of you are going to run it today, but basically by the end of today, I hope most of you or all of you rather have discussed your talks. And we won't go through everyone tomorrow. Uh, I mean, sorry, on Friday, but we'll start. The idea is to stick to your time in the talks, but keep the discussions open-ended. You guys ask very good questions and we learn a lot from your questions. So I don't want to stop the discussions. And keep working on the prep work. I have not forgotten that. Uh, that's a very key part of our um, scaling and, and analysis. And so on Monday, um, we will discuss that. Any other questions? Are you guys enjoying this topic? It's really, I think it's really fun. So in a way it's connecting. Um, I'm glad uh, we discussed the cosmic microwave background because I don't, um, you know, I don't know much about it in terms of the depth with which I know some of the condensed matter examples, but um, if people have more information on the inflaton or uh, whatever, you know, I don't know what the uh, what 
precisely are the analogs of the transverse fieldizing model? I would love to hear more about it. Yeah. The other thing to point out is um, these uh, topics that we are talking about, this quantum phase transition, uh, takes, is, has many new uh, incarnations now through topological order, uh, which I will not be discussed, uh, through topological order, meaning that's the spin liquid part of it, which I won't be discussing here. But there are also some other developments called deconfined quantum criticality, where you notice I very carefully called one of the uh, lines that was vanishing at critical G to be delta order parameter, and the other line to be some gap with a dashed. And that is because I'm looking at one ordered phase and another disordered phase. And that is the transition we are describing. But the new developments have happened between two ordered phases. And if there are two ordered phases, there's no reason they should vanish at a, the same point. You know, one could be decreasing and then they could meet in the middle somewhere and produce a first order transition. But there is some very beautiful work called deconfined criticality, quantum criticality. Um, which I won't be discussing. So I'm just giving you a sense that this, is, this topic is very much alive. And uh, we are doing something that is more standard. But if you come across these things in your research, uh, you will have a good uh, background for that. OK, great. Um, I'll let you guys go and uh, have a good weekend and contribute to the discussions. We'll push some questions through that. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 So Nandi, actually uh, Saad showed me that uh, in Carmen, there's that Zoom tab that shows where all the upcoming meetings are. Uh, so now I see where, where